Well, I'm Melanie and I'm going to be reading this book, Applegate by Fiona Citron. This is one of my favourite books and it's about a young woman who unexpectedly inherits a riding stable from an uncle and the adventures that she has there. It's quite a long book so I'm going to do this one chapter at a time. So this will be chapter one which is called Great Expectations. The early morning sun gleamed through the grimy carriage windows and lit up the faces of the sleeping passengers who travelled on the overnight express. For a moment they stood restlessly in their cramped seats, before the rhythm of the speeding train lulled them back into a doze. All but one, that is. As soon as the warm fingers of light touched her eyelids, the girl in the blue dress woke with a start. For a moment she couldn't remember why she was on a train at all. And then it came back to her. Oh yes, she remembered. The letter. Disregarding the snorts and grunts of her fellow passengers, she ferreted around and produced from beneath their feet a battered handbag, from which she drew the precious crumpled envelope. To Miss Madge Summers, Oakfield Equestrian Centre, Devon. Yes, it was certainly addressed to her, but she still couldn't believe that the solicitor hadn't made a mistake. As if to reassure herself, Madge cast her mind back to the rainy March day on which the letter had arrived. Though she was a very junior assistant instructress at Oakfield, one of her tasks was tack cleaning. She hated it, especially on wet days, when everything came back covered in mud. On that eventful morning, therefore, Madge had been in an extremely bad mood as she dipped her sponge in a bucket of cold, greasy water prior to washing yet another dirt-encrusted girl. She had just squeezed the sponge out when a shrill voice came echoing across the yard. Madge Summers, it said. Come to my office at once. Madge trembled, recognising the steely tones of Oakfield's head girl, Penny. Gosh, she thought. She sounds angry. I wonder what I've done now. Madge crossed the flooded cobblestones with lagging feet, trying to think what crime she had committed. There was only the business about Mark O'Shoe. She'd noticed it was lo loose before they went on the ride, but been too busy to do anything about it. If it had come off and he was lame, there would be trouble. Surprisingly enough, Penny didn't mention Marco or issue. Instead, she handed Madge a long embossed cream envelope, with the request that she could pick up her own post in the morning and not waste the head girl's valuable time. Madge was mystified. She hadn't expected a letter. Her parents were abroad and only wrote once a month, and she'd heard from them a week ago. Anyway, didn't have a foreign stamp. Intrigued, Madge opened up the stiffly folded paper and read through the pages of beautiful copperplate writing. Then, with trembling fingers, she put the letter down on Penny's desk. I've been left to riding school, she whispered in awed amazement. It's a place called Applegate. Then, suddenly realising what this meant, Madge gave a joyful whoop and began to dance around the office. A riding school, a riding school of my very own. Congratulations! Penny sounded genu genuinely pleased. But who left it to you? I thought you didn't have any re relatives in England. Madge grinned. I'd forgotten about Uncle George. You see, he never really got on with Father, and they certainly weren't on visiting to him, so I never even saw him. But it says here that I was left the stables because I'm the only one in the whole family who took up a career with horses. It was several weeks before Madge could take up her inheritance, then she spent the time spinning fabulous daydreams around Applegate Riding School. While she was grooming or mucking out, these shining visions would float before her eyes. Visions of white painted loose boxes, filled with horses, each more aristocratic and brilliant than the last until her daydreams seemed to contain only Olympic gold medal show jumpers and derby winners. These daydreams had even followed onto the train. Madge was in the middle of her favourite one, the one in which she showed admiring visitors the rainbow of champion rosettes that adorned her prospective taproom walls, when a very real elbow poked her in the ribs and brought her down to earth with a bump. Excuse me, dear, said the fat, motherly-looking woman in the next seat. But did you say you were getting off at Ferry Bridge? Train's just pulling in there now. Madge thanked the lady, and in a flurry of nervous anticipation began to pull her luggage from the rack. Five minutes and two split suitcases later, she was standing on a windswept platform, watching the express dwindle into the distance, and taking with it all her optimism and courage. 
as she slowly made her way across the grey desert of concrete that looked more like a landing strip for jets than a train platform. Panic began to grip her with a hot and sticky hand. Looking around, Madge had the uncomfortable feeling that she'd gone off at the wrong stop. Surely that huge ticket office didn't belong to the quiet country setting in which she hoped to find her uncle's stables. The ticket collector, however, was reassuring. This was certainly a ferry bridge. Changed a bit lately, though, he said, with a new town and all. Proper progressive and modern is how it is. New town? exclaimed Madge in dismay, in dismay, her mind filled with pictures of a laundrette where the riding school should be. But isn't there a place called Applegate Stables around here somewhere? Applegate, moves the collector. Now let me see. Ah, yes, there must be some sort of horsey establishment round about these parts, because my cousin collects the manure when the horses pass his house. Proper devil can mulch in his roses, my cousin. This unsavoury information didn't really help much. Madge realised that the horses who so willingly obliged the town's rose growers could have come from anywhere. But don't you know where the stables are? she asked in desperation. The ticket collector was beginning to lose interest, and he could also hear the kettle boiling for his tea break. I'm awfully sorry, miss, he said, but I honestly don't think I can help you. Then, seeing Madge's disappointment, he added less hurriedly, I think your best bet is to ask the police station. It's down the road. With that, he disappeared into the steam-filled depths of his restroom. With a sigh, Madge picked up her cases and began to walk towards the exit. Suddenly, a thin, reedy voice appeared a hearing like the sting of a bee. Are you Miss Madge Summers? it demanded. Madge swung around and found herself facing the most extraordinary character she'd ever seen. From underneath a large flat cap appeared a face the colour and texture of pickled walnuts. The face was balanced precariously on top of a wide red and white striped choker, which in turn clung to the shoulders of a baggy tweed jacket like a furry cat clinging to a tree. Beneath the jacket, shrunken jodhpurs stretched desperately down, without success, towards a pair of ancient army boots. And the whole figure was completed by two yellow string gloves with holes in the fingers. The little man, or such he was, repeated his question with a hint of impatience. Are you Miss Madge Summers? If you are, then I'm Wilfred, the late Mr Browning's groom. If you're not, then I'm sorry I bothered you. Madge hastened to assure them she, she was indeed Miss Summers, and that Mr. Browning had been her uncle. Good, said Wilfred, moving a quid of chewing tobacco from one cheek to the other. I'll take you to see the stables then. Car's only just round the corner. Following behind Wilfred, who had gallantly offered to carry one of her cases, Madge felt much happier. At last something positive was happening, ah, and she continued to feel happy until she caught sight of the car. Instead of the sleek Jaguar or sturdy Land Rover that she had hoped for, she found herself approaching what looked like a sardine tin on wheels. The sardine tin was painted deepest black, but as if to jolly things up a bit, part of it burned a magnificent tawny red colour. On closer examination, this proved to be rust. In fact, the whole car looked as though it ran on elastic bands and a prayer. Madge was very dubious about getting into it. Wilfred, however, proudly waved her towards the front seat. I'll drive, he said. She's a temperamental old brute and not very steady in traffic. You sound as if you're talking about a horse, laughed Madge. Well, I used to be a coachman, and some folk do say as how I never really learned to drive a car. He winked. Between you and me, they're quite right. But I reckon there's not that much difference between steering a high spinnered pony down the country lanes and manoeuvring old tin Lizzie here through the traffic jams. His reluctant passenger did not comment on these words, but instead took a tight hold of the underside of the seat and braced her feet hard against the floor. If Wilfred stopped suddenly, Madge was determined that she at least would not be thrown through the windscreen, even if the windscreen did consist of a large sheet of polythene held on with string. Don't the police ever stop you? she asked in alarm, as Wilfred swung Tin Lizzie out of the car park with a scream of tyres. Haven't yet, smiled the old man cheerfully. Mind you, I don't take the car out more than two or three times a year, and then it's only the nearest pub and back. Come to think of it, I haven't driven through Firebridge since the new town was built. 
It was as this alarming information that he settled the black sardine tin down to a steady 15 miles an hour. Soon they left the town centre and were crawling along vast corridors of identical faceless houses, which each one seemed duller and more stark than its neighbour. Madge said dejectedly out of the window, and wondered if she would ever see a tree or a green field again. Doesn't all this building affect the riding in the area? she asked as they passed yet another new development. Wilfred scowled. I say it does, he growled. Once it was all open country from Applegate right down to Ferrybridge High Street. Those were the days. The old master and me used to escort people out hunting, hiring out horses to the weekend guests on the big houses. Oh, we had some fine runs in those days. Best horses in the country. It's all changed now. This remembering of times gone by seemed to dampen the little man's spirit. And except for a steady stream of encouragement and a boost to the car, he said no more. They reached Applegate just as the car was beginning to choke and gasp for petrol. The stables lay at the end of a long lane which was so overgrown with elder and bramble as to make forward movement almost impossible. As they inched their way down the bumpy track, Madge began to feel slightly apprehensive of what she would find at the end. The worst fears were realised when Wind Wilfred rounded a crumbling horse box resting on its axles in a forest of nettles and turned into the yard. Is this Applegate? she asked, letting her eyes roam with undisguised dismay over the tumble-down buildings and cobbles strewn with weeds. That's right, miss, replied the old groom, rubbing the side of his nose. Of course, it's gone downhill a bit lately, but once it was the biggest stables in these parts and the best. Madge was indignant. I'm not interested in what it used to be like. It's the condition it's in now that worries me. I was led to believe the place was a going concern, not a tumbled round ruin. Wilfred looked hurt. With a lick of paint and a bit of wood, you soon have it right again, he said, sounding rather more optimistic than he looked. Then to divert her attention from all the hingeless doors and fallen roof tiles, he added, Why don't you come and see the horses? Mr. Browning used to look after them as if they were his own children. Sure the sight of them will cheer you up. He led the way through a dim, cool barn, where the air was filled with dust and the musty smell of old leather, hay and straw. When they at last emerged into the sunlight, Madge was dazzled for a moment. Then, shapes began to fill her vision, and the shapes slowly became horses. Surprisingly good horses, too. There were seven altogether ranging in size from a tiny Welsh mountain pony to a big raw-boned grey thoroughbred. The old man and the girl walked towards them over the lush grass of the paddock. We're always careful about pasture, said Wilfred, noting her interest with pleasure. That's why even when the rest of the place fell down, the horses still keep well on good rising. By now Madge was close enough to study the individual animals. Could you tell me their names and something about them? she asked. The old groom was only too happy to oblige. Now, that little Welsh pony's called Megan, he said. She must be all of eighteen years old, but she's bred some fine foals. The den coloured pony standing by herself is stuff, and a right little terror he is. Mr Brownie used to put all the big-headed kids on him to show if they could ride or not. Off there by the trees is Samson and Jolly Boy. Samson's the black one. He's a bit slow, but so quiet you could use him as a pram for a baby. Jolly Boy's a nice sort of horse. Don't see many of his type old fashioned carp these days. That's Caesar of the big bay standing by the gate. My old master used to say he was his most valuable animal. Could put anyone on him and send them out. He'd look after even the biggest fool, make them think they could ride well. And who's this? asked Madge, stroking the pretty dark chestnut pony that had just pushed his nose into her pocket. His name's Sundance, laughed Wilfred. A rather fire frame Sundance of Applegate. Used to be a show pony once, before he broke his knees. Your uncle bred him himself, won a lot of prizes too. Madge scratched Sundance affectionately behind the ear, but her gaze had travelled to the grey thoroughbred who stood, aloof and stately, on the other side of the paddock. He doesn't look like a riding school horse, she said, pointing the animal out to Wilfred. The groomer's face went dark. Useless great brute! Never been able to catch it since it was turned out, he said. Last horse your uncle ever bought. And I reckon all the chasing round the field trying to get rope round his neck did for him in the end. On this rather depressing note, 
They left the horses and went through the cottage where Marge was to live. It was a low rambling place, place which had about it an air of gentle poverty, rather like an ancient duchess beggared by revolution. As they approached it, the little window stared out the new owner of Applegate from behind a curtain of scraggy climbing roses. Wilfred had trouble getting the door open, it was so awful, and when at last he did, an overpowering odour of cats and cabbages flooded out to greet them like a gas leak. While Madge spluttered, Wilfred apologised for the state of the front room. They usually sleep over the stables, he said, but I want to try and keep the place lived in, so I've been staying here. Not done much housework, though. Looking around her, his new employer thought that this was the understatement of the year. After exploring all the rooms, Madge helped Wilfred to remove his possessions and then settled down to give the whole cottage a thorough cleaning. She stopped just before dusk and constructed a meal out of all the tinned food that was in the larder, remembering, of course, to ask Wilfred to share. So, over a feast of baked beans and sausages, they discussed the riding school. Business began to go downhill and most of the big country houses round here were bulldozed to make way for the new estates, Wilfred said noisily mopping up his baked bean juice as he spoke. Where the gentry gone, things went from bad to worse. We used to have nine or fifty horses here at one time and twenty men look after them. Now it's only me, no seven in the field. Madge looked puzzled and asked, but surely with the town growing, there must have been thousands of newcomers willing to learn to ride. <laughs> Mr Brownie never catered for that sort of person, Groom said indignantly. Applegate stables catered only for ladies and gentlemen, and those of the nobility who wished to learn the art of horsemanship. He would never hire houses out of the hurry palloi. That's silly, said Madge. You can't run a business on those lines, not in this day and age. I'm talking about business, just how many clients are there at the moment? Does anyone ride here? Of course, cried Wilfred. Well, two or three at least. But they do come regularly. In fact, Mrs. Shelton and her daughter booked up for an hour tomorrow. Well, I suppose that's better than nothing, Madge sighed. But I honestly don't think we can keep the place going for long on two or three pounds a week. So, what will happen when Madge meets her first clients? Find out in Chapter 2 of Applegate. Bye for now. Hello, I'm Melanie, and this is the second chapter of Applegate by Fiona Citron. In the first chapter, we heard how Madge had gone to take possession of her newly inherited riding stables, and this is now her first day on the job. So chapter two is called All in the Day's Work. Madge woke early in the next morning. For a few moments, she lay in the old-fashioned bed with its brass knobs and gazed at the hunting trophies on the walls. Opposite the bed, a particularly ugly fox leered down at her, showing his yellow teeth in a horrible grin. Hmm, she said. You and your friends are going to find a new home. Unable to stand the glassy stare any longer, she got out of bed and threw open the tiny latticed windows to let in the blustery spring day. I'll have a go at catching that grey, she said to herself, feeling energetic. Surely he can't be as bad as Wilfred makes him out to be. Heavy ground mist had turned the paddock into a silvery lake, and in it the horses stood or lay like unmoving granite statues. The grey, as usual, stood alone, a massive shape against the hedgerows, sparkling with dew. Madge called to him softly, holding out a peace offering of apples. To her vast relief, she discovered that the horse was asleep, his long-lashed eyelids tightly closed and his strong legs locked beneath him. With one easy movement, she slipped a halter over his head and made it tight. And then her troubles began. The grey horse seemed to come alive in a single bound. Like a wild animal suddenly uncaged, he sprang forward, tossing his long mane and raking the sky with lashing forelegs. Madge gamely held on to the rope as the maddened thoroughbred tore away from her. For perhaps half a dozen strides she managed to keep on her feet. Then, as the horse put in a particularly large buck, she found herself lying face down in the grass, being dragged along like a sledge through a forest of wet grass and buttercups. Her muscles screamed at her to let go, but more out of stubbornness than bravery, Madge held on to the rope with grim determination. Round and round the paddock they went with the greys flashing hooves inches from her unprotected head. Then, 
Just in an instant, as Madge felt her wrists were almost about to break, the horse came to a stop. For a while, she lay there on the damp ground, too winded to move. She ached all over, her hands were burning from the rope. Then, slowly, she got her feet and faced the grave. To her utter amazement, he was quietly grazing, and as she began to lead him towards the gate, he followed as sedately as an old donkey. Wilfred was standing in the yard when she arrived. How did you manage to catch him? he asked with amazement. Madge, whose legs were still trembling, and whose heart refused to come down from the back of her throat, tried to answer as nonchalantly as she could. Oh, I didn't have much trouble at all. He, he was a bit naughty in the field, but nothing to worry about. The old groom gave a sly grin and looked pointed at, at the green stain running the length of her jumper and jodhpurt. But he was too good to say anything, and even helped Madge to clear out a loose box for her new prize. Mrs Sheldon and her daughter had arranged a ride at ten o'clock. After breakfast, therefore, Madge sent Wilfred to catch in two horses while she hunted around for some tack. Tack, she soon discovered, was not one of Applegate's strong points. Saddles with broken trees, saddles without lining or stirrups, cracked nose brands, broken martingales, all kinds of things littered the outbuildings in gay profusion. At last, when the hands of her watch were approaching the dreaded hour, Madge found what she was looking for. She was in the barn at the time, burrowing through a pile of straw in the hope of finding something useful, when she came across an old chest. On easing open the creaking lid, she found, to her surprise, five beautifully wrapped saddles in perfect condition, and five equally beautiful snapper bridles. These saved the situation. Wilfred had caught in Caesar and Jolly Boy, and as they tried the tack on them, he explained how it came to be hidden. It was all twenty years ago, said the old groom, with a faraway look in his eye. Them saddles and bridles all belong to Lady Maud Rochford, Duke of Wessex's daughter. She used to keep her horses here at the time, five top-class horses, each one a champion. But then she well in love unwisely, and his lordship was so proper mad that when he found out, he sold all her horses and sent her to Switzerland. But why did my uncle keep the saddles hidden away? said Matt. Because, said Wilfred with a knowing wink, it was him she was in love with. I reckon he kept those saddles hoping she'd come back one day. And did she? asked Madge. Not her, went on Wilfred. Married some German cow never came back to England. Madge found this little story rather touching and handled the old tap with respect due to his romantic past. Then the taxi bearing Mrs Sheldon and her daughter rolled into the yard. Madge walked over to greet her first clients, and was met by the sight of a stout, spiky-haired lady who was arguing fiercely with the taxi driver about the fare. These tradespeople always try to cheat one so. She boomed as she turned from the angry driver and grasped Madge's hand. I'm sure you find my thing, my dear. Madge, remembering all the unpaid forage bills that she had discovered, rather thought the boot was on the other foot but was too polite to argue, and smiled sympathetically. And this, continued the large lady, hardly pausing for breath, is my daughter, Florence. A long, limp girl emerged from behind Mrs Sheldon and shook hands weakly. She seemed all teeth and glasses, pale, droopy, straw-coloured head, a person more unlike her mother you could not imagine. Florence is a brilliant little rider, the child's doting parent told Madge in a loud whisper. Only she doesn't get all the practice she needs. She's such a dedicated girl, you know. Always at her school books when she shouldn't be out on a horse. Here Mrs Sheldon turned towards her daughter. Not like your old mum, eh? She said, and gave her such a jovial slap on the back that the poor girl almost fell down onto the cobbles. Feeling sorry for the blushing Florence, Madge changed the subject. I've had Caesar and Jolly Boy tacked up for you, she said. I hope that's all right being new here and not knowing the horses. She broke off as the stout lady grabbed her arm in a bone-crushing grip. Don't tell me! Is that a new horse? she asked, dragging Madge in the direction of the grey thoroughbred, rather like a puppy pulls a bone. It's much the best thing I've seen in these stables. Madge began to explain something of the adult's history, but was interrupted. You know, that's just the kind of mount I'd like to see my daughter on, continued Florence's mother, admiringly. Look at the spirit in him, she added, 
as the grey, frightened by her loud voice, rolled wide eyes and prepared to kick. Twenty years ago I would have shown a horse like that who's master. Judging by the tree-trunk proportions of the lady's arms and legs, Madge had no doubt she would. But she did look, doubt the pallid-looking Florence's ability to ride the grey, and said so. Mrs. Sheldon, Sheldon was offended at this slur on the daughter's horsemanship. If she isn't allowed to ride that horse, then we won't ride at all. Faced with this massive warrior of a woman, Madge feebly gave in. After all, she thought, it's not my neck that's in danger and I can't afford to offend my only clients. She decided, however, to accompany the hack, if only out of more curiosity as to how the grey would behave. Suddenly Florence, who had remained silent all the time through this bargaining on her behalf, spoke for the first time. I don't think I really want to ride him, Mammy, she said in a strangled voice. Perhaps I could have Jolly Boy instead. Her mother was deeply shocked. Nonsense, child! You'll feel totally different once you're on his back. Florence looked unconvinced, but it was settled. Madge took Jolly Boy, Mrs Sheldon took Caesar, and poor Florence took the grey. Two older riders were soon in the saddle, but it was obvious that their young companion was having trouble with her unruly steed. Do hurry up! shouted the girl's mother. If you're not ready soon, we'll go without you. A faint sigh of relief passed Florence's bloodless lips at these words, but it was short-lived. Wilfred, who had shamelessly hidden in the barn on their Mrs Sheldon's arrival, now saw that he was in danger of being cursed with her daughter's presence for a whole hour. Swiftly he emerged from his hiding place, grabbed the hovering girl's ankle and hoisted her bodily into the saddle. He then disappeared again before anything else could happen. To everyone's surprise, Florence managed to stay seated, and soon the little cavalcade of three riders clattered out of the yard and started off down the lane. At first, all went well. The horses seemed to enjoy trotting through the warm spring sunshine. They arched their necks, washed with pleasure down their velvet noses, and only broke their stride to snatch at the succulent leaves and grasses which grew in a jungle around them. Johnny Roy was particularly good at this swift snacking. Madge found herself constantly pulling great handfuls of half-chewed bramble stems out of his mouth. At the end of the lane, Mrs. Sheldon called a halt, sat facing the main road like a general considering a battle round. We'll go to the common, she said at last. Won't be so muddy there. And after issuing this order to her lagging troops, she set off at a brisk jog, looking for all the world like a rather beefy version of Napoleon. Madge's feeling of being part of a conquering hero's cavalry escort grew as they travelled along the echoing streets of the housing estate. By every front gate and in every front garden, people gathered to watch them pass. Mothers left their hoovering, fathers their lawn mowings, and even teenage sons and daughters briefly looked up from their phones to follow the horse's progress. Madge was embarrassed at being the object of so much interest, but Mrs Sheldon loved it, and even slowed down to walk so that people could get a better view. At any moment, Madge thought, she's going to give the royal salute. Meanwhile, behind them, the grey horse was working himself up into a fine state of nerves. The drumming of his own prancing hooves on the tarmac, Florence's limp and ineffectual riding, and the staring, chattering onlookers had combined to irritate him past bearing. His prancing grew wilder and faster until he was all but cantering sideways. Oh, Mummy! squeaked Florence desperately trying to gather the sweat-soaked reins. I don't think I can hold it much longer. Mrs Sheldon gave her daughter a withering look. Rubbish! And you know you enjoy a challenging ride. Now do be quiet and stop making yourself look silly. Florence lapsed into a pained silence. By some miracle they reached the common without further mishap. The common was a wide stretch of gr scrubby grass and gorse that projected like an island of green from an unbroken sea of red brick houses. It had once been an old deer park, but now the only signs of its more elegant past were two large gothic gates posts, crowned with rampant griffins which still guarded the entrance. Madge felt quite intimidated as she rode past the haughty stone beast. They seemed to be looking down on the great curved beaks at her, and comparing Jolly Boy unfavourably with the high-stepping horses that had, in times gone by, passed beneath a lofty perch. But even winged monsters had not overall Mrs Sheldon, and she brought Caesar to a snorting halt between the wrought iron pillars, with a contemptuous disregard for the dignity of the griffins. Flanked by the gargoyles, she issued her instructions in a loud and ringing voice. 
Now, girls, pay attention, she boomed. I suggest that we canter one at a time along the bridle path and when wait for the other at the far end. Madge was a bit put out by this. She quite justifiably felt that clients should not order around riding school proprietors like this. But objections went unheeded by Mrs. Sheldon, who, gathering up her reins and putting heels to her horse, disappeared in a cloud of dust. Madge swallowed the word she was going to say next and turned to Florence. You'd better go next, she advised, eyeing the foam fleck grey warily, and I'll follow behind to pick up the pieces. This observation was drowned by the thoroughbred's blood-curdling whinny as he took off in a series of kangaroo bucks which left his rider clinging to the saddle like a storm-tossed squirrel up a tree. They were halfway up the bridle path before Madge realised the grey was bolting. From a vantage point on Jolly Boy's broad back, she watched with horror as the big horse gathered speed a runaway express train of bulging muscles, his hooves striking the hard earth with the force of iron pistons. Behind him followed the thin wail of Florence, Florence's voice. Help! I can't stop! I can't stop! The rest of her heart-rending plea was lost in the wind. Further along, Mrs Sheldon heard her daughter's cry and acted immediately. With a flourish of bridle leather, she swung Caesar into the grey horse's path, but her old gesture went unrewarded. Within a few feet of her, the thoroughbred threw on his brakes, turned as nimbly as a pony po and thundered off in the opposite direction. After them! roared Florence's mother, applying her whip to the fat bay hunter's side. Don't let them reach the ditch! Madge had no idea where the ditch was, but she gamely put Jolly Boy into a gallop and raced after the flying grey. It's like the ride of the Valkyries, she thought as the rushing air stung her face and forced the breath into her lungs. Three dishevelled females on three mad horses. We may take off into the clouds if we go any faster. This prediction, for one of them at least, almost came true. Before Florence's terrified eyes, the deep drainage ditch loomed ever nearer and ever wider. Petrified with clear, she clung to the horse's mate, praying the grey would clear the obstacle. He probably would have. It hadn't been for Mrs. Sheldon's advice. Use your reins, you stupid girl, she yelled, bearing down on her daughter in awful range. Unfortunately, Florence did as her mother told her, just as the horse rose to take the jump. The grey horse, checked by the bit of this critical moment, seemed to pause in mid-leap and hang, suspended like a hawk against the clear blue sky. Then, as if in slow motion, his whole body twisted and he fell back into the ditch. Florence, by some lucky twist of fate, landed on the bank and hurt. But as Madge and her mother approached, she first started to whimper and then broke into a doleful howl. Mary, Mary, I want to go home. I hate horses. I never want to see another one again. For the first time that day, Mrs. Sheldon looked lost for words. But, but darling, she finally blurted out, you're not hurt, you're shaking up that all. Florence, however, had taken enough and would not be comforted. I wonder home. If you don't take me home, I'll scream and scream and scream, she said, beginning to go purple in the face. Confronted with open rebellion, her mother became flustered. I'm so sorry, she said to Madge, but I'll have to take her home. Bonus had never acted in this way before. But what about the horse? cried Madge. I can't get him out of the ditch by myself, and he might be injured. Oh, I can't be bothered with that now, said Mrs. Shelburne. Anyway, such a dangerous animal would be better shot. It was with these unsympathetic words that Mrs. Sheldon gathered up her sobbing daughter and began to walk away. Madge watched her go with despairing eyes. What am I to do now? she said out loud. I can't leave the grey, perhaps to get help. Uh, perhaps I could be of some assistance? The speaker was a thin, red-haired young man, with an interesting more than handsome face, but to Madge in her hour of need, he resembled the angel Gabriel and Sir Galahad all rolled into one. I, I was out with my dog, the young man said indicating a panting Irish setter. And I saw what happened to the top of the pass. 
Honestly, people like those two shouldn't be allowed within five miles of a horse. Madge agreed with him wholeheartedly. Have you any ideas on how to extract a large horse from an narrow dish, she said, gladly taking him up on his offer of help. Or if not, perhaps you could go to the nearest phone box and ring for the police. No need for that, the young man grinned. I've got a couple of spades in my car. If you can use one, I think the best thing would be to try and dig the horse out, or at least make the ditch wide enough for him to get onto his feet. The spades were fetched and they both set to work with a will. Soon a large mound of earth had grown above them, while down below the two rescuers burrowed even deeper into the soggy earth of the bank. During all this, the grey lay quietly, too stunned to move. As he felt his prison wider, however, he began to struggle, thrashing around in the dish like a landed salmon. We'll have to keep him still, Madge said anxiously. He'll hurt himself or us if he carries on like that. I'll stop him, said the young man, taking off his jacket. He then climbed out of the trench and lowered himself down beside the frightened horse. Easy, boy, easy, he said, and carefully slipped his coat over the animal's head. The grey quietened almost immediately. You understand horses, said Madge, full of adoration. Where did you learn that trick? The object of her admiration smiled self-consciously. On the race course, he answered with a laugh. I used to be a steeplechase jockey, so this isn't the first time I've had to deal with a fallen horse. Usually, though, they were on top of me at the time. Madge laughed too, but then a puddled look came into her eyes. Do you know, she said, I'm sure that I've seen you before. It was the mention of steeplechase. You're Tom Palmer. I remember seeing your photograph in a magazine. You just won the gold cup at Kempton. Cheltenham, actually, Tom admitted with a hint of pride, before his face grew dark. But I'm trying to live all that down now, he added. But why? said Madge. Let's say that I had a slight disagreement with a novice hurdler over the correct way to jump a fence, and he won. I got rather mashed up, and that was the end of my racing career. But that's enough of my problems. Let's try and sort this horse out. Now the difficult part of the operation began. Tom took hold of the thoroughbred's head, and Madge watched anxiously as he encouraged him to roll and get out of the ditch. Ten minutes later, they at last managed to get the horse to his feet and he stood trembling like a leaf with the sweat pouring off him in long muddy streams. When they had all recovered a little, the horse would carefully search for injuries. Except for that gash on his hind leg and a few bruises around his flanks, he doesn't seem too badly hurt, said Madge. What do you think? You're the expert. Tom, however, was staring at the grey horse in a very peculiar manner. It's a funny thing, he said, running his hand through his carroty hair. What with you recognising me and all that? But I'm certain that I know this horse. Look, he said, do you see that scar just behind his girth? Madge nodded. Well, it's in exactly the same place that a hawk was called Sky Dragon had one. He got it when he staked himself in a fence. I remember because I was riding him. Sky Dragon was a chaser then, said Madge. One of the best, carried on Tom. He was the first horse that I ever won a race on. But after that business at the stake, he broke down completely. Completely. The owner sent him to Sandown Sales, and I never saw him again. You know, I wouldn't know who owns him now, would you? I'd make them a fair offer for him. Perhaps it's sentimental, but I've got a fellow feeling for this horse. We both suffered the same fate in the racing games. So we might as well share the same retirement from him. As a matter of fact, said Madge, he belongs to me. I inherited him as part of my uncle's stable at Applegate Riding School. Applegate? Tom sounded surprised. But that's the very stables I was trying to buy only a few months ago. It's not far from my brother's farm where I'm living now, and it seemed the perfect place for me to start a new career with horses. Unfortunately, the old man was asking more than I could afford, and then when he died it seemed to be that. Madge looked grim. Well, I wouldn't forget about Applegate altogether, she said. Things carry on as they are. It's going to be back on the market very soon. Those two women you saw walking away were virtually my last customers. And I haven't got enough capital to keep it going until I find some more. There was a long silence, and then... Don't bite my head off if you don't like the idea, Tom suddenly said. But what do you think of a partnership? A partnership? Yes, a business partnership, said Tom. I'd put up 5,000 capital, and you'd provide the stables. In that way, you'd still keep Applegate, 
and I'd get a stake in the riding school I wanted. What do you think? Madge didn't give him the time to reconsider. Done, she said, and they both shook hands. So, things are looking up for Madge. See what happens next, in the next chapter of Applegate. Bye for now. Hello, this is Melanie again, and this is chapter three of Applegate by Phil and Citron. In the first two chapters, we saw how young Madge Summers received her unexpected inheritance of the riding stables, almost had a disaster on her first day, and received some unexpected help in the form of retired jockey Tom Palmer. So let's see how things progress in the next chapter, which is entitled Clock Eaters and a Policeman. Oh, what a beautiful morning, sang Tom Palmer tunelessly as he slapped yet another brushful of whitewash onto the stable wall. Oh, what a beautiful day, I've got a wonderful feeling, everything's going my way. He came to the end of the verse and stepped back to admire his handiwork. The whitewash certainly made a big difference to the rickety loose boxes. The only trouble was their gleaming walls quite put to shame the rest of the dingy outbuildings. And Tom's mood hat began to wilt a little when he thought of all the work that still had to be done. The roofs especially needed seeing to, and most of the gutters hadn't been cleaned out for years. I know, he said to himself. I'll tackle them now. There's not much doing in the riding school at the moment, so I've got time. And he went whistling off to get a ladder. Meanwhile, his business partner, Madge Summers, was sitting gloomily in the office doing the accounts. Unlike Tom, she couldn't see anything to smile about in the stable's lack of commercial success. In fact, she thought, checking the columns of money spent and earned and finding a gaping discrepancy between them, if we don't get some customers soon, I don't see how we can carry on. It was while she was chewing her pen in the depths of despair that the telephone rang. Hello, Applegate Riding School, can I help you? Madge answered, wondering if it was the forage merchant calling about his unpaid bill, or the blacksmith refusing to come again unless he was paid cash on the spot. Oh, good morning, replied a fruity voice on the other end of the line. I wonder if it would be possible to book a ride for five people at twelve o'clock today. I have some guests down for the weekend, and as your stables are nearby... Yes, of course, replied Madge was so excited she nearly dropped the phone. I'd be delighted to arrange something for you. Could I just have some details, please? So within five minutes, Madge found herself with spirits quite restored and heading for the paddock to catch in half a dozen horses. She passed Tom on the way and stopped to get, tell him the good news. He, however, seemed more interested in removing a particularly large and smelly jackdaw's nest from the top of a drain pipe, and he merely smiled politely while still fishing about for bits of stick with the prong end of a garden rake. Infuriated by his apparent lack of interest, his partner left him to it. Madge soon brightened up, though, because just thinking about giving a ride at last made her somehow sing inside. Carefully, she planned the route they would take. Over to Berry Den Woods, perhaps, past the old watermill, and then down to where the railway had once been. Now that the tracks had been removed, the disused branch line made one of the best bridle paths in the district. Happily musing on these problems, she opened the gate of the paddock and then stopped dead. Not a single horse was there. At first, Madge couldn't believe it. She spent several fruitless minutes searching around the hedges, but the field was completely deserted. The only thing she did find that confirmed her worst suspicions was a gap in the fence where a stake had been removed. On each side of the gap, the ground was poached with hoof marks. Calling down fire and damnation on those who were responsible, Madge fled back to the yard. Tom was just about to start creosoting the gutter when he heard his partner roaring up the path from the fields like a maddened bull. Startled, he swung it round to see what was wrong, and completely forgot that he was perched eight feet up on a ladder. The expected happened, and down fell the ladder with a crash and down fell Tom with an even louder one. As for the tin of creosote, it exploded against the wall with the force of a small bomb, which resulted in the best action painting ever to be seen outside an artist's studio. 
What in heaven's name is the matter? spluttered Tom angrily as he picked himself up from his uncomfortable resting place. You nearly made me break my neck rushing around like that. Just look at the walls. It'll take hours to whitewash it all again. Sorry, said Madge, her face scarlet with rage, but some idiot's broken down the fence and let all the horses out. I hate to think where they are now. Galloping down the motorway, I shouldn't wonder. Well, if that's the case, we'd better get after them, and quickly. I'll tell you what, added Tom, forgetting for the moment his bruised bones. You search the housing estate end. I'll scout around the fields and roads at the back. Don't worry. Our horses are far too lazy and greedy to have gone far. Somewhat comforted, Madge agreed with him, and, collecting a bundle of rope halters, they both prepared to set off in search of their wandering livestock. Before they left the yard, however, the girl had an idea. I'll tell Wilfred what's happened, she said, referring to the old groom who'd been at Applegate almost since it started fifty years ago. Perhaps he'd wait by the telephone, just in case somebody sees the horses and rings through. She found Wilfred in the field room, slicing carrots. I heard the crash, he said, looking up with relish. Suppose that young fool of always broken his neck at last. Can't tell you me word climbing up walls like that. Ain't natural. Why, in my days, a gentleman wouldn't dream of doing such a thing. It was a job for a labourer cleaning out gutters, not a fit occupation for the owner of a riding stable. Madge sighed. Poor Wilfred. He lived so much in the past that her partner's rather progressive ideas were a constant source of irritation to him. Still, he really shouldn't be that nasty about people. Honestly, she told him crossly. I believe he'd be quite pleased if Tom was hurt, and after all he's done for the stable, too. But, for your ungrateful information, he's perfectly all right. What's definitely not all right, however, is that someone's let the horses out. Let the horses out? Who do a thing like that? If I knew that, said Madge, I wouldn't be standing there. That's the period, miss, her employee grinned. Just like your old Uncle George. Then the old man added, I think I might know who was to blame. There were gang kids hanging round the paddock yesterday and throwing mud at the horses too. I gave them the rough side of my tongue, I can tell you. Nasty little objects they were. Oh, stop moaning about the younger generation, Wilfred, she said. The important thing now is to get the horses back in one piece. I want you to wait in the office just in case any information comes through about them. Will you do that? Wilfred agreed. Match set off in front of them in search of the missing animals. Outside, the day was hot and humid, and the threat of thunder was in the ominously still air. Big clouds like purple bruises lay heavy over the land, filtering the sun's rays into a sticky glare. Madge, clumping along in her tight riding boots, felt utterly exhausted before she'd even reached the place where the green fields were swallowed up by the long tentacles of red brick houses. Whether that like, like that always upset her. Then, all of a sudden, she perked up. There, plainly outlined in the soft turf of the verge, were the hoofprints of several horses. Tying us all forgotten, she swiftly went to follow them. The trail led towards Ferry Bridge and seemed quite recently made. Madge only hoped that she could catch up with the hoofprints' owners before they reached the busy town centre. Any animal who got trapped in that jungle of concrete and cars wouldn't stand a chance. She rushed on past the gnome-filled gardens of the housing estate, stopping Ogeny occasionally to ask a passer-by if they'd seen anything of the horses. Most of them just stared blankly at her as if she was mad. But at last, one old lady did volunteer some information. She told Madge that she'd been slipping round to visit her granddaughter, but this, there was this great black cart horse feeding off the azaleas. Gave me quite a turn, it did, the old lady said, rolling her eyes. So I ate me barley at him, and he trotted off. Gone towards the recreation ground, I shouldn't wonder. You know, the posh one with a bandstand and the floral clock. Thanks, shouted Madge, already running. Thanks awfully! The informant shrugged. Shrug. Well, I do declare, she murmured to no one in particular. What would people be keeping as pets next? Elephants, I shouldn't wonder. The recreation ground lay behind grim iron railings, as if daring anyone to enter and spoil its neatness. Madge, feeling very conscious of her faded jeans and straw bedecked jumper, hesitated uncertainly at the gate. 
As the old lady has said, it was one of those posh places. Very nice for Sunday stroll in your best dress, but not so good to go rushing through looking like a refugee from a pig farm. Still, she thought, I've got to find the horses. And, plucking up her courage, she sallied forth into the park's disapproving depths. She found herself on an asphalt path running straight as a ruler between rank upon rank of military-looking daffodils. Even the trees, spaced regularly along its length, appeared stiff and unnatural, rather like those plastic ones in model train sets or in miniature gardens. Madge disliked the whole set intensely and was just thinking about searching elsewhere when she came across a pair of flat black haunches poking out of a forest of ornamental shrubbery. It was Samson, the horse which the old lady must have seen. Samson seemed to have an obsession about exotic bushes, for he was now stuck fast in the biggest, prickliest holly bush that Madge had ever seen. With a sigh and a brave disregard for scratches, she launched herself to the rescue. Five minutes later, clothes torn, hair dishevelled, face bleeding, the owner of Applegate emerged from the green gloom, towing a very unrepentant black cob. Samson didn't seem at all put out by his ordeal. In fact, his first act of freedom was to butt his saviour playfully in the stomach as she was about to buckle on the halter. Mastering her temper with difficulty, Madge forced herself not to thump him and instead gave him an undeserved pat. Come on, old fellow, she said. I'll have to forgive you because I need your help to find the others. Madge's plan was simple. By tying the halter rope around Samson's neck, and pointing him into the direction of hoofprints, she hoped the cob would lead her to his companions. And, to her horror, that's just what he did. The entire herd was gathered around the floral clock, eating it. Madge's jaw dropped with dismay. The floral clock was Fairy Bridge Council's pride and joy. It even appeared on postcards of the town. Now it lay trampled and chewed out of all recognition by the hoofs and teeth of six destructive horses. Get out of there at once, you revolting animals! Madge screamed frantically. The horses merely lifted petal-powdered heads and gazed at her in amazement. Surely you couldn't be shouting at them? Then Sundance, one of her special favourites, came walking daintily over the daisy-studded turf and looked at his mistress with such innocent eyes that she just collapsed in a heap of hysterical laughter. Now then, <coughs> now then, what's going on here then? These words, spoken loudly and with inches of her ear, brought Madge to her senses with a jerk. The speaker was a burly policeman who, by the stern look on his face, seemed to have no sense of humour. Are these your animals, madam? He continued. I suppose you know that they're committing an offence. I'm so sorry, officer, the object of his wrath replied. But it isn't really my fault. Someone let them out of the field and they wandered into the park on their own. The policeman didn't seem very impressed by this explanation. But he softened a little. But the girl's face became more and more woebegone. All right, miss, he finally grunted. I let you off this time, but you've got to get these animals out of here, and quickly. Madge was only too grateful to comply. But, unfortunately, catching six impish horses was no easy job. She asked the burly policeman for help. He was a bit dubious at first, not knowing the front end of the horse from the back, as he put it. But, after he told them that without his aid she would probably be chasing round the park all day, he agreed. It was decided that he, being the less agile, should stay where he was and hold on to the horses as she captured them. This plan worked surprisingly well. Most of the horses had now had their fun and seemed quite glad to give up their freedom. Even Sky Dragon, the big grey thoroughbred who had proved so troublesome in Madge's early days at Applegate, consented to follow his mistress back to the policeman come hitching post, where he and the guardian of the law regarded each other with great suspicion. The only one who seemed determined to play games was Snuff, the wicked little pony whose white-ringed eyes, flattened ears, proclaimed trouble with a capital T. 
Come on, Snuff, wheeled Madge, stalking him. Come on, there's a good boy. Snuff, however, was not a good boy. He waited until his pursuer was near enough to grab a handful of wane, mane, and then, with a leap and a bound, he was off, leaving her with a few ginger hairs and some broken nails. She called him at last in a small summer house, which he was sharing with a terrified middle-aged lady and her hysterical Pekingese, both of whom obviously resented the intrusion. Sorry, said Madge. She threw herself at the snorting pony and proceeded to have a wrestling match with him all over the shelter. You'll have to excuse me while I get this halter on. The lady, however, was not mollified by these words and stood on a bench, uttering a series of piercing screams while the dog leapt up and down beside her like a little furry yo-yo. Eventually, Madge succeeded in winding the halter rope tightly around Snuff's muzzle and this immediately brought him to a head-shaking stop. On seeing the cause of her fright securely bound, the lady regained her voice. I'll report you to the park keeper, she screeched. It's an utter disgrace. Madge didn't wait to hear the rest. With another hasty apology, she swung onto the dun pony's back and rode off as though the devil was after her. And, she thought, with the luck I'm having today, he probably is. Back at the remains of the floral clock, the policeman stood surrounded by horses looking like a blue surge maypole. Madge dismounted before reaching him. She didn't want to be booked for riding in a public garden, or whatever the re recreation ground was called. She was eligible for too many charges already. And about time too, the guardian of the law said, when she arrived leading Snuff. I've been stood here for hours and these horses are getting restless. Just as he spoke, a low rumble of thunder boomed across the nearly roped grass and rattled the stiff trees. The horses, snorting a wild eye, began to get the jitters, and their previous restlessness turned almost to panic as the first pink flashes of lightning split the sky. It was no time to be polite. Keep hold of them! yelled Madge to her companion, who seemed to be having his arms dragged out by the terrified animals. We can't stay out in the open like this, not in an electric storm. We'll have to get the horses under cover. Look, there's that concrete bandstand. If we'd only get them under there. And so, in a nightmare of noise and fear, the policeman and the girl began to drag their charges towards safety. they just about made it before the rains came down and shut the world off in a curtain of roaring water. Standing inside the mushroom-shaped bandstand, with the storm crashing all around them, Madge discovered that the policeman's name was P.C. Wilkins. And they started to talk, mainly because there was nothing else to do, but also it took their minds of what was happening outside. P.C. Wilkins began by telling Madge about his work in Ferrybridge and how it had changed since the new town had been built. What required it was in the old days, he said. Crime went way then would be Simon Oates poaching a few of Farmer Mary Weather's game birds, or Mrs. Lawrence at the back bull hitting her husband over the head with a bottle. Now, of course, more likely to be a bank robbery and always vandalism. I'd call whoever let my horses out with vandals, said Madge. Cause enough damage one way or another. The policeman nodded. Still, he added, looking serious. You mustn't think all the young people in Ferrybridge are as bad as that. Real trouble is they just haven't enough to do in a new town. No way they can run their energy off, so they store it up until it breaks into lawlessness. Madge was not convinced. There's plenty for them to do if they only look for it. For instance, I'd be very glad of some help at the stables. There's enough work at Applegate to occupy anyone who would care to volunteer. I mean, that's if they don't succeed in running off all our horses. The discussion carried on in this vein, and at last the rain stopped, and the pale silvery sun began to peep from behind the ragged grey clouds. Madge collected a string of horses and prepared to leave. Well, goodbye, said P.C. Wilkins, after helping on to Samson, from whose broad back she was going to lead the others. Don't worry too much about the damage your animals did. I can see it wasn't your fault. And by the way, he added with a smile, keep those horses of yours inside at night in future. Save trouble all round. Madge agreed. With a cheery wave of her hand, rode off, towing her troubles behind her. So, things are starting to look up. How will the ride go? 
Will she get any volunteers? Watch out for the next chapter of Applegate. Bye for now. Hello, it's Melanie again with the next chapter of Applegate. This is chapter four. So in the last chapter, we had some escaped horses that chewed up the floral clock and Madge made friends with the local policeman. So let's see what ha happens next. Chapter four, enter Paddy Brogan. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon when she at last turned in at the stable yard. Tom was waiting for her, looking gloomy. Those people came and I had to put them off, he said. They were a bit upset about it, so I doubt we'll get any more bookings from that quarter. Never mind, replied his partner. At least the horses are safe and that's really all that matters. But secretly, Madge was still disappointed. Clients were hard to find. They decided to follow PC Wilkins' advice and keep the horses in at night in the future. And that afternoon, Wilfred and Tom drove into town to buy extra straw for bedding. Madge stayed behind to clean out some of the loose boxes, in readiness for their new inmates. After removing bicycle frames, old lamps, piles of rotting carpet and other such junk, she began to wonder if her late uncle had been a scrap merchant and not a riding school proprietor after all. She was just untangling a rusting radiator from its nest of metal and dirt when there came the sound of an engine in the yard. She dropped what she was doing and went to investigate. To her surprise, a battered horse box had drawn up outside the cottage. She started to cross towards it just as the driver dismounted from his cab. Hello there, he shouted in a strong Irish accent. Is it Miss Summers I have the pleasure of addressing? Madge nodded, eyeing the tall gaunt figure warily. He looks like an undertaker, she thought, dressed in that shiny black suit. But then again, an undertaker wouldn't wear a stripy shirt. I wonder who he can be. The box driver soon enlightened her. My name is Paddy Brogan, he smiled, showing yellow wolf-like teeth. I have a horse stealing business up at Abbot's Cross, the village down the road. I heard you taking this place over, thought you might be in need of a few good horses for the riding zoo. I'm sorry, Mr Brogan. Madge couldn't help giving a sigh. But we're not doing too well at the moment. There's hardly enough customers to ride the horses we've got. I couldn't possibly think of buying any more at the moment. Paddy Brogan, however didn't give up that easily. Sure now, if that's the case, then I've the very thing for you. What you need is a beast that'll win for you in the local shows. It'd be good luck publicity like. People will start asking where such an animal came from. That would put the name of your stable on the map. Well, Mas Madge could digest this argument, he had already lowered the ramp of his horse box. Now just look at this gelding her, he continued, pointing to a wild-eyed chestnut with a russet mane and tame. He's only four, but he's the biggest leap this side of the ocean. Just come over from County Wexford not three weeks ago. Completely unspoilt, and not a blemish on him. I'm giving him away at 250 because I've no time to school him myself. Paddy then led the chestnut down the ramp and held him for the girl's inspection. He was a long-legged, breedy-looking animal of about 16 hands, and, despite a pair of enormous floppy ears, remarkably handsome. Madge stroked his velvet muzzle, visibly weakening in her decision not to buy. The dealer saw this and pressed an advantage home. Shall I just trot him around the yard for you? he said. Sure, he's got a lovely action. Floats across the ground like a feather, he does. For once in his life, Paddy Brogan was telling the truth. And Madge watched entranced as the young horse glided around the cobblestones in an ecstasy of rhythm and grace. Twice round the yard they went until she could stand it no longer. She had to have that horse. Come on, May. Oh, he's lovely, she gasped. And the Irishman, scenting a sail in the air, immediately pulled her merchandise to a halt. You'll have the gelding, then, Madge nodded. And a wonderful bargain you have, too, the Irishman reassured her. Sure, it breaks me old heart to see him go, but I'm a poor man and I can't afford to keep horses for my own pleasure. Madge felt almost sorry for him as she fetched her checkbook. On her return, she found the chest and already tied up in one of the stores. Sure, he looked quite at home there, said Paddy, folding the check that she gave him carefully. And remember, if you ever want any more horses, Paddy Brogan is the man to come to. With that, he climbed into the horse box and was off.
Slowly the Irish magic that he had spun so easily began to disappear too, and as it melted into the cool evening air, Madge began to feel a little uneasy. What on earth had possessed her to buy this horse, without seeing so much a warranty or a vet certificate? She didn't dare to think what Tom would say. Tom, on his eventual return, said a lot, and said it very angrily. He explained precisely why they couldn't afford another horse, giving exactly the same reasons that his partner had given in the first place to the Irish horse dealer. Unfortunately, Madge lacked the dealer's persuasive replies. Maybe she had the wrong accent. And another thing, Tom finally ended with, you haven't even seen the Adamel in the saddle. It may be a confirmed bucker or rearer for all you know. By then, Madge had just about had enough. Right, she scowled. I'll ride him now, this minute. She tucked the chest and up with no trouble at all. He was a little shy of having the bridle put on, but nothing to worry about. Then, with a glare at Tom, she led the horse out and swung into the saddle. To her relief, the chestnut stood quietly. There you are, she said, in a triumphant voice. He's perfectly... Madge's next words were spoken from the floor. Oh, what happened? Her partner couldn't answer for a moment. He was doubled up with laughter. <laughs> he lifted his hind legs, dropped his shoulder and whee, splat! You went straight, sailing straight over his head. To my mind, that horse has never had a rider on his back before. I bet he isn't even broken in. Madge, watching the chestnut gelding go bucking and kicking round the yard, trying to rid himself of her best saddle, had to agree. I'll take him back to Paddy Brogan in the morning, she said, rubbing her bruises. Morning came, and Madge went with a heavy heart to the stables in order to prepare the gelding for his journey home. As she opened the box door, a long ray of, ray of sunlight flooded through the opening, catching the horse's coat and turning it to liquid gold. He was beautiful. She sighed. Surely it wouldn't take long to break him in. Hardly knowing why she did so, she dropped the halter and ran to the tack room. Once there, an old canvas and head collar was snatched from the wall and a lunging rein and whip dug out from a pile of old rugs. Thus equipped, Madge returned to the chestnut, soon as he was be and soon he was being led, resplendent in all his lunging finery, towards the paddock. She started him off easily, letting him lope around on the end of the webbing line without any interference. The young horse behaved very well, obviously having played this game before. Then, gently, she asked him to walk, and to her delight he obeyed. Right, said Madge to herself. Now we can really get down to work. The next half hour went by in a flash. She was mesmerised by the horse's grace as he circled around her, his big muscles bunching and stretching under the gleaming golden coat. Walk, trot, canter, halt, the chestnut hardly put a foot wrong. Instead, he seemed to listen to, for her commands with his long ears pricked, and took pleasure in carrying them out as quickly as smoothly as possible. Madge forgot all about returning him to the dealer. A little while later, Wilfred wandered by. Wilfred, she called, could you fetch a saddle and bridle to fish, fetch this horse? I'm going to try and break him in. Right away, miss, the old man said, his eyes lighting up. There was nothing he liked better than to see someone trying to break a horse, or if that failed, their necks. Shall I give you a hand, Miss Summers? If you would. The chestnut was tacked up, the bridle over the lunging house, and Madge went and stood by his shoulder, talking to him all the time. Then, very gently, she began to put her weight into the stirrup. The horse flinched and snorted. Madge tried again. And so it went on. Chestnut gradually getting used to more and more weight, until at last she was sitting on his back. Okay, Wilfred, she said, taking a firm grip at the front arch of the saddle. Lead him on a few paces. As Wilfred tugged gently at his butt, the horse tensed. Every sinew resisting Madge forced herself to act calmly. Suppressing, suppressing the wish to get for, both feet safely on firm ground, she gingerly pressed her heels into the horse's side. He took one step, and then another, until at last he was walking sedately across the paddock. His rider still felt as if she was perched on an unexploded bomb, but as the chestnut continued to behave, she began to relax a little. 
soon she was able to unfasten the lingerie, and when this had been accomplished without mishap, she sent Wilfred to find Tom. Madge was determined to make her partner eat his words of the previous day. She was sitting easily in the saddle, dreaming of what Tom's astonished reaction would be on seeing how quiet her mount had become, when suddenly the chestnut threw up his head and stiffened, his long ears swivelling like radio antennae. There was a terrible commotion coming from the yard. The noise came nearer, and suddenly Wilfred hurdled the gate and ran towards her, red-faced and panting. They're coming! he gasped. Who are coming? A gang of teenagers marching down the lane! Madge dismounted hurriedly and handed the chest into the old groom. Honestly, you make it sound like an invasion from outer space. Still, I'd better go and see what they want. She reached the yard and found it crowded with young people. There must have been about twenty of them, aged between about twelve and eighteen. And although they all wore those outlandish clothes, clothes, they looked quite friendly. Then a girl detached herself from the throng and came over. She was a little older than the others and rather more soberly dressed. I'm Joan Warwick, she introduced herself. Secretary of the Ferry Bridge Youth Club. Madge smiled politely but looked puzzled. We've come to help you decorate your stables, Joan continued with a laugh. Constable Wilkins told us you needed help. He's on the committee, you know, and here we are. Madge was flabbergasted. Oh, that's terribly nice of you. Are you sure you don't mind lending a hand? Only the place is falling to bits and there's an awful lot to do. We don't mind, honestly. It'll be good practice. We hope to build a new youth club one day, when we get the money, so you'll really be helping us if you let us practice painting and such like. And so they all set to work. When Tom arrived later, after sneaking into town to meet some old racing friends, he could hardly be of his eyes. What on earth's happening? he asked Madge, when at last he found her making gallons of tea in the kitchen. There's a gang of kids pulling the stables to bits. They're not pulling it to bits, replied Madge, searching in the larder for enough biscuits to feed the youngsters. They're rebuilding it, or rather they're doing the painting, mending the roof and things like that. You should be jolly grateful. Tom was, more than he thought possible. The past few days had given him an intense dislike of whitewashing. I'd better go and see what they're doing, he said, and wander off happily to watch other people work for a change. They gave a barbecue for the youth club that evening. Everyone was invited, it, and it turned out to be a super success. At the end of the evening, Madge announced that, in appreciation for all the work that everyone had done, anyone who wanted could come and have a free ride the following day. This announcement was met with cheers, and in the morning, Applegate Riding School was busier than it had been for a very long time. Most of the youngsters hadn't even sat on a horse before, but they were quick to learn, and soon were going five at a time around the paddock. In teaching all these eager teenagers, Madge felt, Madge felt in her element again. Oh, why can't it always be like this? she sighed, watching the bustle in the yard, as yet another batch of horses and riders went out. Little did she know how soon her prayers would be answered. It started in a small way. Two of the girls coming back from the ride stepped up shyly to her and asked, I wonder, would it be possible to book up for more lessons? We've enjoyed the one we've had so much that we really would like to come again. Madge was delighted, but it didn't stop there. More and more of the youth club's members developed the horsey bug, and soon nearly all of them put their names down to come back. We're in business at last, said Madge, as tired but happy, she and Tom began to put the horses away for the night. And that's not all. Most of the kids have younger brothers and sisters who might be interested in coming as well. I do believe, smiled Tom, that you knew all this would happen. How do you make that out? puzzled Madge. Well, you bought that new horse, didn't you? He stopped outside the chestnut's box and was watching the animal peacefully eating his hay. Perhaps your confidence brought us luck. By the way, what are you going to call him? Jester. Jester? said Tom. Well, there's like that I could hardly call him anything else, laughed Madge. So, there's chapter four. Things are looking up, things are getting busy, and Madge has a lovely new horse. See what happens next in chapter five. Bye for now. Hello again, I'm Melanie, and I'm back with another chapter from Applegate. 
So in the last chapter, we saw Madge making friends with a little youth club who came to help out, and she bought herself a new horse with floppy ears called Jester. So let's see what happens next in chapter 5. Drummer Boy and the Gypsy Drummer Boy hated horse boxes, and he particularly disliked this one because he was receiving such rough treatment from one of his companions, an Irish mare. She'd grown very restless and was furiously kicking and biting everything around her. Drummer Boy was one of a number of horses and ponies that Madge and Tom had bought at an auction in a nearby town. It had been a long day, and it was dark when they drove back to Applegate with their purchases in the horse box. The Irish mare's bad manner so affected the other horses that they became too excited and caused the whole box to lurch dangerously. Tom was forced to pull over to the side of the road. While he and Madge were trying to sort out the trouble, Drummer Boy made his escape. Drummer Boy had been the mount of one of the leading international riders, but his jumping career had ended when he strained his front tendons and never regained his own form. Since then he had worked in a riding school. Madge thought he would be an asset to Applegate. But now, frightened and excited, he threw up his head and jerked the halter rope from Tom's hand and thundered away into the dusk. Madge wanted to go after him, but Tom dissuaded her. We'll never catch him now, it's too dark, he said. Anyway, we can't just leave the other standing here. We bring the horse box out first thing in the morning and organise a proper search. Madge realised that this was the best course of action, and dejectedly they loaded the problem mare back into the horse box, separating her from the other horses with the barricade, and drove off, leaving the little roan pony alone in the darkness. At first Drummer Boy thought only of putting as much distance between what the hateful horse box and himself. He galloped noisily along the tarmac road, sparks of fire erupting from his steel shoes and his mane blowing free in the night wind. Once he saw a car and swerved to avoid the yellow headlights that blazed like a tiger's eyes out of the black and silver shadows. Once he ducked terrified as a huge owl blundered out of the hedgerow. Then, slowly, the hot fear left him, and he slowed to a walk. The warmth of the day had long gone since for the setting sun, and cold little breezes whipped about his damp, damp coat, making him shiver. The pony halted and dropped his head. He felt lost and frightened, and he missed his warm stable with his deep golden straw and oat-filled manger. For a time he just stood dejectedly in the blustery wide ro roadway, but then instinct took over, and he stumbled towards a large hawthorn bush that loomed against the dark sky. Once enveloped in its thick pr prickly branches, the pony felt, felt both safer and less wind-blown, and pressing himself deeper into the leafy greens, he settled out to sleep. He was still there when Billy Hackett came whistling down the lane on his way to school. Billy Hackett was a gypsy boy with black curly hair and equally black eyes, which were as bright and quick as those of a thrush. He hated school, but the councilman was always coming to the camp and making trouble if the children there didn't attend, so his father insisted on him going. Still, he was almost old enough to leave now, and he was thinking happily about this when he saw the roan pony. Billy approached the animal, his whole face lit up with joy. If there's one thing he loved best in all the world, it was horses. His father didn't keep them any more, nor did any of the other gypsies. The piebald ponies that had once been their pride and joy had been exchanged for cars and caravans that were motorised. But Billy was a throwback to the old type of Romy. He had horse fever in his blood. Oh, my lad, oh, there, my fella, he whispered, laying a sunburned hand on Drummer Boy's neck. We're going to be friends, you and me. The pony snorted and arched his neck. Here was a human at last, and humans meant warm blankets and sweet hay. He was sick of a night of fending for himself. Billy, seeing how willing he was, quickly slipped his belt around the roan's neck. Once again he patted him and noticed how the animal's coat stared with cold, and he saw the torn skin where the Irish mare had sunk her teeth in. Poor old fella, he said. We'd better get you home and patch it up. You shouldn't be wandering around in that condition. Billy turned and began to walk back to the camp, with the pony following him like a large and bumbling puppy. The gypsy camp was situated in a field just off the main road. In a secluded corner, women were doing their washing, and Billy avoided them carefully. One of them was his mother. He led the pony towards a strikingly painted caravan, which stood out like a bright flower from amongst the cream-coloured trailers surrounded it. He knocked on the door and waited. It was answered by his great-grandmother. A gypsy of the old school who still wore the long flannel petticoats and delicately crocheted shawl. 
What have you got there? she asked, peering at the pony. Bea looked embarrassed. I found him. The old lady laughed. Hmm. Didn't take him from another Romany, did you? You steal from a brother, you're cursed. I keep trying to tell you, her great-grandson sighed. I found him up by the Lufton Road. He's been pretty badly knocked around somewhere. I thought you might be able to doctor him. Oh, aye, aye, I can still do that. I may be old. My hands haven't lost their cunning. Now bring the animal round the back out of sight. We don't want your father to see. When Billy arrived for the pony, the old lady was waiting for him with a bottle of evil-smelling liquid in her hand. What's that? asked the boy. Never you mind. It's my own special recipe for putting life into horses, or anyone else for that matter. She took a swig at the bottle, and Billy watched fascinated as the green trickly brew bubbled down her throat. Now that you're satisfied it's not poison, said his great-grandmother, perhaps you'll open the animal's mouth so I can give him some. Drummer Boy was too far gone to object, and soon he was dosed and laying down gratefully on a pile of old flock mattresses and sacks. Just leave him there for a while, said Billy's great-grandmother. I've put some ointment on his cats and within the hour he'll be as good as new again. Boy settled down beside the pony, determined to keep an eye on him until he completely recovered. He was still sitting there, dreamily stroking Drummer Boy's forelock, when his father appeared. Norman Hackett was a giant of a man, dark-faced and blue-jowled. What's that horse doing here? He roared in a voice that made his son tremble. Billy started to explain how he'd found the pony, pony but the tall gypsy cut him short. You get that animal away from here now this minute! I don't want no trouble with the police. But I didn't steal him, Billy yelled back in desperation. Anyhow, I can't turn him loose to wander around the road. Norman Hackett, who was not really the hard man he liked to make out, wavered. In that case, you'd better take him down to the local Nick. They look after him until the owner turns up. His son cheered up considerably at the suggestion. Perhaps if nobody claims me, they'll let me keep him, he said, urging the pony to his feet. They do that if you find money or dogs. You can put that idea right out of your mind, scowled his father. We ain't got no room here for horses. And with that depressing information, he stamped off, leaving his son staring mutinously after him. Billy! It was his great-grandmother calling. She poked her head out of the caravan door, and, after assuring herself that the coast was clear, beckoned him with a crooked talon of a fingernail. Come here, here, boy. I've something to show you. Billy knew better than to dissipate the fierce old lady, and he climbed the steps and entered the caravan. His great-grandmother was hunched over an old carved chest from which she drew a bundle wrapped in dirty newspaper. With almost religious respect, she slowly unwrapped the parcel, until she held in her weather-beaten hands the most beautiful bridal that Billy had ever seen. It was your great-grandfather's she said, stroking the soft leather straps and the gleaming silver bit. He was a real king of the Romanese, who never owned less than thirty or forty horses at a time. This was made for his favourite stallion just before he rode him in the Ballydoria races. Her eyes misted over as she remembered the wild days of her youth. He had a bet with my father that day, and if the stallion won the race, I would be allowed to marry him. Of course, the stallion did win. Jem came galloping back to my father's caravan, swept me up on the back of that big bay horse, and off we rode. Billy shuffled his feet uncomfortably. He wasn't very keen on romance. In fact, he would much rather have heard the story of how his hard-riding ancestor had won the race in the first place. The old lady sensed that his attention was wandering, and she thrust the bridle into the boy's arms with a snort of annoyance. Now you look after it, you hear? One scratch on that leather and the ghost of Jem Hackett will haunt you. On the other hand, treat it well, it will bring you luck. Billy could hardly stammer enough thanks. Can I try it on the wrong pony? he said. Of course, said the old lady. That's what it's for. You weren't thinking of bringing it around your own neck, were you? They went out into the sunlight and after some adjustment managed to fit the well-oiled straps to Drummer Boy's small head. There, it fits perfectly, Billy said. Then he sighed. Don't know why I'm getting pleased about it. I won't even have a pony tomorrow. His great-grandmother gave a wicked chuckle. That's up to you, my boy. 
I know what Jem would have done. Once he put his mark on a horse, that horse was his, even if he had to cross the Irish Sea to keep it. With that, she scuttled back into her caravan. Billy would have given the old lady's remark some consideration, but just then his father appeared, bellowing like a wounded animal. Hey, do you want your way yet? Do you want me to give me the, the end of my belt as a present? <gasps> the boy didn't wait to hear any more, as with one easy movement he gathered the reins, leapt onto the pony's back, and was off at a canter out of the camp. Young Billy Hackett had learned to, learned to ride in the days before the car had ousted horses. He had a strong natural seat and good balance, so when their own pony put in a couple of cat-like bucks, he merely dug his knee in harder. This annoyed drummer boy, he started to gallop along the roadside verge. But Billy let him. He was enjoying himself. A little way down the road from the gypsy caravans was a bridle path which fed across country, roughly in the direction of Lucton. Lucton was where Billy was supposed to be heading, containing as it did the country police station. Therefore he turned the pony onto the long grassy track without any stir of conscience. Drummer boy now seemed to share Billy's enjoyment, being no doubt fortified by the old lady's medicine. He cavorted like a three-year-old, tossing his newly acquired bits so that it caught in the sun and burned in a fiery arc. Gypsy boy patted him. Come on, my lad. Let's see what you can really do. With these words he again urged the roan pony into a flat-out galloper. Drummer boy literally flew over the ground, and Billy felt that at any moment he would sprout wings and soar into the air like Pegasus. On and on they raced, until at last Billy felt Drummer Boy slacken his speed, and realising that the pony had had enough, he eased him to a walk. Steam rose in clouds from the spetty animal, and he was blowing heavily. His rider, wondering if he'd overdone things, swiftly dismounted and began to rub his trembling mount down with handfuls of grass. It was while he was doing this that he first noticed the police car. It was parked just below him in a dip, with a bridle path across the main road. The police car wasn't the only vehicle there either. A large horse box stood beside it. Billy held his breath and watched as two people climbed from the horse box and began talking to the policeman from the car. Then they all started to intently search the ground. What on earth could they be looking for? The answer suddenly hit him. Of course, the roan pony. For well, he remembered it was only just down the road that he had found Drummer Boy. He mounted the pony again and with a heavy heart began to guide him towards the car. But suddenly he halted. Why should he give their own back? Those people were so careless as to lose him, and that was their hard luck. Anyhow, Billy thought, I saved the animal's life. It could have been killed wandering around in its own like that. So reasoning, however wrongly, he turned his mount's head and set off at a fast trot in the opposite direction. His way led up a steep hill, on top of which was a crumbling stone wall. Once over this, Lucton Moor stretched in front of him. Mile upon mile of purple heather and bog grass, which offered both a hiding place and freedom. Billy set off in high spirits. He felt like a crusader, like riding off to the ends of the earth in search of fortune. Dreaming this way, he jogged onwards. The day was warm with golden sunlight, thick as honey, sweeping into the purple bell flowers and drawing forth their heady perfume. Furry bumblebees were everywhere, making a murmuring chorus which seemed to lull even the birds to sleep. But he rubbed a grimy hand over his face. He tried to keep his heavy eyelids from drooping, but it was no use. Lulled by the scents and sounds of summer, he fell into a doze, and letting the rain slide through his limp fingers, allowed the pony to wander where he would. Then, all of a sudden, the boy felt as if he was falling. At first he thought it was part of a dream, but the snort of fear from their own pony was all too real. In an instant he had opened his eyes and shot his hands out to save himself. It was lucky he did so, for it was only the strength of a hastily grabbed clump of bracken that saved him from falling down the steep sides of a chalk pit. Drummer Boy was not so fortunate. With a horrible slithering sound, the crumbly white soil gave way beneath his feet, and he began to slide slowly down towards a deep pool which was formed at the bottom of the pit. Billy watched, horrified, as the pony hit the muddy surface with a splash. He'll have no chance in there, he thought grimly. The water must be twenty feet deep. Then, to his relief, a miracle happened. Somehow the pony managed to get a footing on a small ledge beneath the, the water's surface. But he didn't think twice. He knew that if the animal struggled it would be the end of him, so, taking off his heavy boots, he slipped and crawled down the chalk face, and just managed to get near enough to catch the terrified horse's bridle. Easy, easy, 
he crooned to the horse, praying the drummer boy wouldn't thrash about and so break up his fragile foothold. Just keep still now. Help will come. But he was mistaken. Help did not come. For hours, it seemed, he sat there with a the pony's head cradled in his arms. The world went on its way, unknowing about him. Hot sun shone, the bees hummed, dragonflies skated above the water on iridescent wings. But not a sign of a human being did he see. Often he was tempted to leave Drummer Boy and go for help, but every time he tried to move, the pony began to struggle again. So he contented himself by yelling as loudly as he could for help, until his voice finally gave out. Evening came, and with it the gnats. They fluttered in the haze over the, the pool, and the gypsy boy had just resigned himself to either drowning or being bitten to death by invading insects, and he suddenly thought he heard the bark of a dog. He thought his ears were playing tricks, but then, pursing his face painfully to look up upwards, he saw a large black Labrador at the edge of the quarry. The voice shaking with emotion, Billy called to the dog. To his utter delight, it scrambled down towards him, panting and grinning like an excited child. The dog obviously regarded the whole thing as a huge joke. When it reached the boy, it fell upon him in delight, wriggling so much that Billy was hard foot to get hold of its fat black body. At last, he managed to grab the dog's collar. But how was he going to get a message back to its master? Then he remembered his exercise book. It was in his back pocket. He was supposed to have been handed in that day for a history essay to be marked. But he pulled the book out and tore off the last page. He held the squirming dog between his knees, and with the stub of a pencil, he quickly wrote his message for help and tied it firmly to the dog's collar. Off you go, then. For heaven's sake, find your owner, he said, giving the laughter Labrador a hefty whack on the rump to send it on its way. The dog needed no second bidding. In a trice, it was off galumping up the quarry side and kicking about a ton of chalk dust back into Billy's face. But he hardly noticed. He was too busy swatting the insects. Another use that he's found for his invaluable exercise book. Labrador's owner, when at last he arrived, turned out to be a slim military-looking man with a bristling ginger moustache. He took charge right away. So and have you out of there, he said briskly, and thanks to the fact that besides being very confident, he was also a retired air vice-marshal, his words were soon proved correct. In less than half an hour, an RAF rescue helicopter was lowering its winch, first to take up the astonished gypsy boy, and then to raise the equally astonished roan pony. After that, everything happened in a kind of hazy world of cocoa, blankets, Land Rover trailers, and a lot of military orders laced with rough kindness. Billy and Drummer Boy were whisked off to the Vice Marshal's home at the edge of the moors, and there they were housed in luxury that neither thought really existed. It was in these pleasant surroundings that Billy had last had to face the police. The ordeal didn't turn out, so, turn out so badly, they accepted the story that he'd been on his way to the police station when the pony had fallen. When they left, however, that he didn't feel any happier, they had gone to fetch his father. He knew for certain that Ned Hackett would never accept such a feeble tale. He'd soon realised that the chalk quarry was nowhere near the bridal path to Lepton. He was saved, surprisingly enough, by the arrival of Madge Summers when she came to collect from the boy. She received such a glowing report of the young boy's courage from the air vice marshal that she was determined to thank her, him herself. Billy was a little embarrassed by this, seeing that the whole thing was his fault anyway, and he spoke modestly. But this only served to impress the girl even more, so that by the end of the, the interview, Billy found himself being offered a job in Applegate stables. Billy jumped at it. Not only would he mean that he could be near his beloved pony, but it would also provide an escape from his father's wrath. And so the young boy joined the staff of Applegate, and a jolly good worker he proved to be too. So, another chapter, another adventure, and another new friend from Madge. See you next time on Applegate.